Welcome to 106 Life Factors. Today we have Patricia Elizi, and she will correctly pronounce that name for me just to uh, make sure that we got it right. Um, she is going to tell us about herself and the type of work that she does, but int, she's an immigration attorney, and so it is exciting for us to um, gain enough information from her and in turn make that into knowledge and steps that we can take some action. Thank you for joining us, Patricia. Hi, Sonia. Good, after well, good afternoon where I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> hope all is well. Uh, my name is Patricia Elise from okay. the Elise Law Firm, and I'm an immigration attorney. I'm based down in Miami, Florida, um, and what we do is we help immigrants and their families navigate the U.S. immigration system. So it can vary from helping a family um, be reunited, right? So helping other family members come to the U.S., or it can it varies as well. For example, I help a lot of musicians, um, mm. musicians from abroad who are looking to have access to the U.S. market. That's something that we do a lot of, actually. So we, I'm originally from Haiti, actually, so we were born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. So I've gone through the immigration process myself, so I've seen how it's impacted my immediate family. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen how, you know, it's opened so many opportunities for us and it's really changed our lives and our future generations' lives. So it's great to be able to help other families kind of go through the same process and get access to the market for work or things like that. I really like what I do. <laughs> it's great that you do have, you know, your journey takes you from Port-au-Prince to um, the U.S. So I'm sure clients um, really um, appreciate that when you share that with them, that, you know, you you know what you're talking about because you're, you've you walked that um, path. And so um, you can empathize with their experiences. I, I want you to share, though, more about, um, you said most of your clients are are those who want to tap into the entertainment industry. What exactly are they looking for? Is it like a work visa to, to, to actually visit and stay or to kind of market their products in, in the States while living overseas? Explain it to us. So for example, um, I help with the immigration aspect of the inter international entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you are a solo singer or if you are part of a singing group and you'd like to actually come and perform in the United States, you need the proper authorization to do that. A lot of people come to the U.S. using either their visa waiver or their B-1, B-2, which is their tourist visas to mm -hmm. come and perform. They should not be doing that. That's a big no-no. So if you're coming to the U.S. with a tourist visa, you're not allowed to work. And if immigration sees, so if the immigration officer at the airport were to see that you're coming in to perform, they can stop you from entering. Or if when you go and renew your tourist visa at the U.S. Embassy abroad and they're taking a look at your history of travel, and by the way, they also have access to your social media pages, mm -hmm. you know, things <laughs> They can definitely verify, oh, are you using this tourist visa that you're supposed to be coming in to go to Disney World, right? Right. Um, actually coming in to work, which you're not allowed to do. Hmm. So there are different immigration options available for someone like that. Um, I tend to work with singers that are from cultural, very cult like culturally rich communities. So, for example, um, in Haiti, there's a lot of music that we have that you can only find in Haiti. Yes. Right? One of them is called Kompa. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, Kompa is a traditional Haitian type of music that is not known worldwide. Mm -hmm. So, because of that, I'm able to help my musicians actually apply and qualify for a visa for culturally unique groups and that's the actual title on um the the immigrant the web the government website that says is there a name and a visa number so, yeah b1 b2 yes. what's the visa number it's a p3 p3 so 
the P3 are for culturally unique performances. It could be a singer, it could be a dancer. So for example, if someone dances, is a professional dancer of a kind of dance that is unique to your culture in your country, mm -hmm. if you sing a type of music that is unique to your country, then you would be able to qualify for some of these visas. Because when it comes to musicians, there's only so many different kinds of visas available. Right. The majority of them call for documentation showing that you've met um, and that your music is known on an international level. You may and, not have- And it can be translated. It makes sense. Whatever the talent is, uh, can be displayed. Right. Mm -hmm. right. But for example, if, if you're in Jamaica, you're in Haiti, you're in um, a small island, you may not have the capability of showing to U.S. immigration that, listen, my music is being played all over the world for you to qualify for this visa. That's a P1. Mm -hmm. But there's another visa a lot of people don't know about, which is the P3, which is if you can show it's culturally unique, mm -hmm. that, that, that's a that's a way in. Yeah. Well, I may not be known all over the world, but the kind of music that I perform is culturally unique. And I'm coming to the U.S. to share that piece of my culture in the United States. And uh, there's a couple of things that I want to ask, but let me jump on this quickly before I forget. You, you, uh, is there a, an invitation that is required in order to uh, meet the, um, the visa requirements? Or probably you could so, take, tell, tell us the steps to that to in order to be eligible. Sure. So when it comes to, for example, a P1, a P3, an O, those are the different visas available to music to musicians, for example. Mm -hmm. You will need a US, you will need a US based person or organization or company that files the petition on your behalf. Sponsor. Right. That sponsors you, correct. Mm -hmm. So it can be it can even be an agent, for example. Okay. So with musicians, it's really, it's a lot of fun to work with them because I end up in seeing different situations. So I can have a record label who's sponsoring an artist or I can have an agent, right? Mm -hmm. Who is able to show, listen, I'm able to get this person these 10 gigs so I have 10 different people who want to sponsor them. I have 10 different people who want them to come in. Mm -hmm. So here are all the contracts with 10 people. Instead of having one person sponsor you for the whole year, you have an agent that represents everyone that's bringing you in. Right? Well, that so, sounds rich. <laughs> that sounds very good because the options are, are plentiful for people in that industry, it seems. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um there's a huge there's a huge difference also between a petition and a visa mm -hmm. so for, the visa is issued at the u.s embassy abroad at the consulate for you to get to that step first you need to have the sponsor file a petition for you with uscis in the united states mm -hmm. that request has to be approved if it's approved then it's sent to the State Department, which is where the consulate is under, for them to review your request as the immigrant for a visa based on the petition. So our, our role is to really work with both the petitioner and the beneficiary. So on, go ahead. Yes. So we work with both the petitioner and the beneficiary to build the case to send this request to USCIS mm -hmm. so that that can be approved so that the immigrant artist has a chance of requesting that visa at the embassy. So that embassy, for example, in AD, eventually will receive some type of notification that is it, or is it the, 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 the beneficiary receive the notification first? How does it happen? in terms of the, so first, the results. The so first the petitioner gets the result of that petition that was filed. So the mm -hmm. sponsor who filed the petition will get a decision okay. as to whether the petition was approved or not. 
Mm -hmm. the petition is approved, you'll get an approval notice. That approval notice is sent to the petitioner with the names of the beneficiary listed on it, right? Right. So then once you get that approval, the immigrant will make an appointment at the U.S. Embassy abroad and present that approval notice and say, I, I would like to apply for a visa based off of this petition that was approved for me that says that hmm. I have these contracts and I have these gigs for the next year. So wait a minute. I thought it would be the the fact that the sponsor or the petitioner slash petitioner uh, maybe get the approval. It would be an automatic send to the um, immigration the immigration office, say in that home country, in the in the in the beneficiary home country. You're saying that's so not the case. The file will be sent. However, each each immigrant still needs to make an appointment at the consulate to request a visa. And the visa application has to be reviewed and the visa now has to be approved or denied. So, so, are, what there is, so are there additional paperwork that the beneficiary has to provide? Yes, ma'am. Mm. So once the petitioner, once the petition is approved, the file is sent to the, the U.S. embassy in your home country. Now you have to request the visa based off of the petition. To do that, you have to go online, fill out paperwork, make an appointment for an in-person interview with the immigration officer. So let me give you an example. I've had bands that were approved and let's say the band had 10 people in it. Maybe eight people will get the visa, two will be denied. Maybe five will get it, or maybe none will get it, right? Wow. And why is that? It's because even though the petition is approved for the entire group, each individual immigrant has to request and be approved for their visa based off of that petition. Mm -hmm. so let's say someone had a criminal issue obviously they're not going to get the visa right let's say someone had applied for a tourist visa in the past and they were denied so that's going to impact whether they're going to get this work visa to come in because mm -hmm. for you to qualify for the tourist visa is the same qualifications for this one year visa to come and perform mm -hmm. you be able to convince the immigration officer that you're not going to overstay when you go to the U.S. Right. So that's where you are. You come in because I'm thinking there the these beneficiaries are going to have a lot of questions as to mm -hmm. what they put on the form, what they filled out, what to say, how to prepare for the interview, and just the whole documentation process. Right. Right. So with us, first we work with because. The petition is based off of documents we get from both parties. Right. So we work first on building the case to send to USCIS. Once that's approved, we will have a meeting with our beneficiaries to, to tell them and prep them on how to go about making the appointment and all of that. But then everything else is kind of up to them and the U.S. officer abroad because first, even if I were in their home country, they wouldn't allow me to come in to the consulate for the interview. <laughs> so a lot of because it's completely different immigration within the u.s and immigration outside is night and day mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very very interesting i want to go back to something that you said earlier on you said that because some individuals will you know travel on their b1 visa visitors visa to the u.s knowingly uh, and know that you know what they're going to attend a, a, an event to perform but they just want to fly under the radar because they know the process of the, the complications of trying to get a p1 or a p uh, is it p1 p3 yes yeah exactly. so what are some of those consequences that they may um, face and have you come across those type of situations Yes. So I've seen artists where they try to come in, they have their guitar on their back, right? Or they have <laughs> some type of equipment and the immigration officer at the airport says, hey, you're going to come here to perform? And they said, yes, I have a gig. Oh, wow. Uh, 
oh, you have the wrong visa. So what they do is they don't allow them to come into the U.S. Because they, they take away, mm -hmm. they take away their their visas. They don't let them come in. And um, in, in your case, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So with a with a B one B two visa, you are not allowed to work, and they can say they didn't know. You know, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. But for the most part, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're not allowed to work. <laughs> right. So let me ask you this. Um, have you come, come across any cases like that? And what can you do now to remedy any of those consequences to allow the person to come back um, seeking peti to petition for a, um, a P1 or P3 and actually, you know, get them approved? So honestly, it depends on what happened. I have, but it um we've been able to help some, and we have not been able to help others because it depends on whether the immigration officer at the airport either withdraws your request for admission or issues an expedited order of removal. So we're at the airport. You're in front of the immigration officer. You're requesting to legally enter the U.S. on your tourist visa. Okay. The immigration officer comes and realizes you are coming in with for purposes that don't match the visa that's in your passport. Mm -hmm. So he has the choice of of asking you, are you sure you really want to come in? Or do you want to turn around and get back and go home on the next plane? So that's him giving you the ability to withdraw your request to come in so that you don't have a deportation order on your case, okay. right? Mm-hmm. And then the immigration officer also has the option of saying, you know something, I'm going to start removal proceedings against you, or I'm going to order an expedited order of removal, which is wow. where you don't even get to go in front of the judge. Um, that that sounds I, pretty serious. Like, yeah, that's kind of, it gets a little bit more complicated and it really depends on the discretion of the immigration officer and what he sees in the system and all of that. So do they, is there a penalty, like a phase where it's said, like, okay, you are, uh, ex, um, you're deported and you have to wait 10 years or 15 years before you can even apply again. Is there such a thing or, or you can probably, yes. okay, go ahead. So if someone is deported, you, for the most part, they will get a piece of paper that tells them you were deported under X section of the law, which means that you have a bar of admission for five years, 10 years, or maybe a permanent bar. Um, so for us, if the person doesn't already have their full documentation, what we do is we request a copy of their full file from, from immigration. And mm -hmm. I say immigration because immigration is made up of different agencies. So if I wanna see what the judge said, the immigration judge, I would request their EYR file. If I want to see what happened with their applications that they sent in um, with immigration, I would request their USCIS file. And if I wanted to see, for example, what happened every time they entered the United States, I would request their CDP file. Or if I wanted to double check what answers they put on their um, applications for visas, I would request their State Department file. So we know oh. that every phone call, every uh, research is money, money, money. It takes a lot of money for you to be pulling data, reading data, interpret data, and then translate data back to the, the party, the petitioner, or you know the beneficiary, all the parties involved. So uh, 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 an entertainer from the poor communities of 80 or poor communities of somewhere in the Caribbean is just trying, you know, want to go somewhere to make it. They don't have the money. Um, and the petitioner is saying, well, I'll help you, but I just can't help with the money either. <laughs> um, you know, how, how much are we talking about? I mean, you don't have to tell us your fees per se, but just a range of what's involved in, in securing um, uh, an entertainment visa in that cultural category. So the the first important comment is you will be 
surprised um, the capability of anyone, right? Hmm. When it comes to trying to reach their goals. And advance um, their lives, huh? And advance their lives. Yes. If if there's anything in life that you want to do, you don't have the funds to do it. Obviously, you're not able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to having access to the U.S. market for a musician that already has some type of following in Haiti, it's an investment. In Haiti and Jamaica and a small community in South America, wherever it is. Right. It's an investment. So, you know, obviously someone who's just starting off, doesn't have an album, doesn't have a following, is not making any money at all. You know, how are they going to, first, what contracts do they have to come and perform in the U.S.? They're not going to have that. Okay. Um, what access are they, you know, it, it's just, this process is really for artists who have a career already in their home countries who are mm -hmm. able to show me this is you know this is the music that i've done these are the albums that i've published these are the articles that have been written about me you don't have to be the biggest artist in the country ah, but you need mm -hmm. to be somehow known right because i need the evidence to be able to build the case um so these are the awards that i have been given um this is the local um performances that I have done these are the festivals that I've performed in mm -hmm. and if you think about it honestly I think it's more economical for a band to come to the U.S. versus a single person because when you're paying a law firm for example for a green card for an individual and you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars that's for one person to come in that's for your mm -hmm. spouse to come in your fiance etc for a band you know, for example, we don't charge extra unless you have more than 10 people. Okay. So you have 10 oh. people, mm -hmm. but let's say you let's say you have a band of five. So you have five people that are getting together. So you have five people, in extension, you have five families that are getting together to pay the filing fees, the cost for this band to have an opportunity to come to the U.S. and perform. So you're treating that group of people as like a unit. That's what you're saying. Correct. Okay. Because I represent the band mm -hmm. the entity. Mm -hmm. um, each individual has to qualify for the visa on their own. But the band, so the evidence that I'm presenting is for the band, not for the guitarist. Right? So they have so to provide like a, each individual in the band then would probably have to provide a portfolio of so i would provide so um okay i would be presenting on paper the accomplishments of the band okay the media coverage of the band the performances of the band i would mm -hmm. be i would be presenting the passports of each individual I'd be presenting the position that they play in the band. But if I'm doing a petition or if I'm helping someone with a petition, it's presenting everyone together. Okay. So that the band and the music and what they've done together qualifies for it. Okay. You're saying that th there's a um, there's some similarities between the P one P three, but there are differences. What is what what are is that has to do with levels of um type or the what type of is it the type of entertainment then? Well, the P one has nothing to do with the kind of music that you perform. Mm -hmm. The P one is all about whether you've reached an international level or not. Okay, and whether you've been in the band for whether the band has been a unit for more than um, a year. So for a P1, you have to show, okay, these are all the different countries I've performed in. These are all of the medias in different countries that have covered my music. These are the awards that I have been given. This is the evidence that not only am I known in my country, but I'm also known abroad. Okay. So that's going to be a little harder for a band to meet 
in certain circumstances, right? Mm -hmm. So it may be easier for the person to show, okay, obviously if you're playing if you're playing pop music, that's not gonna work. Pop is not culturally unique, right? Mm -hmm. Gabodai is culturally unique to Haiti. Gabodai is a, a kind of music you will only find in Haiti. Okay. Um, a Haitian pop singer would not qualify for a P3 because pop is not culturally unique to Haiti. Okay. So what are some kind what are what are some kinds of um music or dances? That are culturally unique to Jamaica, obviously outside of reggae. Well, if you're talking about before the um, 2000, I can tell you, um, we know that skia, mento, um, those type of uh, music are, are really um, special to our culture, and um, you know, you know, maintaining our culture. So I know those are sought after in terms of um, trying to you know, replicate it in different music, especially in Europe and, and, and the US. So I know those are sought after. But lately there have been so many, which because of YouTube, it is not as special as you may think because the moment it reaches YouTube, everybody copies it and then it lost its, um, you know, its authenticness and then there it goes. But it still has its origin. Its in origin. In Jamaica, it's it also it's also like Zouk, right? Zouk music, mm -hmm. um, it's become very popular, but it still has its origin in the Caribbean. So, if if I'm able to show that this kind of music, this is the history of the music, this is right. how the music came out, right? So for each, which is why I really enjoy these these cases because for each group I have to say what kind of music you perform do an analysis of the music presented on paper to USCIS mm -hmm. then I have to prove that the artist performs that kind of music by showing okay these are the articles written about them and this is where it says this is what they do by contacting experts in the field so contacting music producers that have been doing this specific kind of music forever and like helping them write letters of support um you know sometimes we have to think outside the box but mm -hmm. we always trying to find a way you know sometimes we can reach out to maybe the minister of culture mm -hmm. to try to get a certificate that says we certify that this person or this group plays this specific kind of music mm -hmm. once we once we're able to build the the group's profile then we have to show, okay, they're coming to the U.S. to perform in these cultural events. You know, here's an event that celebrates Caribbean music. Here's an event that celebrates Black music. Here's an event that only focuses on Jamaican culture. Mm -hmm. And this is the contract showing that they're coming. So, number one, this is the cultural music. This is the cultural medium. Number two, this is what they do. They fit under this umbrella. And number three, they're coming to the U.S., to really share that culture or sometimes even teach it. Let's say that you're a music teacher or you're a dance teacher and you really focus on the specific kind of music or um, dance that is culturally unique to your culture, then you would be able to qualify for the P3. So I know you're talking a lot about music, but you know, I the, the interesting thing is when you run a, a nonprofit organization and you come across people who, you know, they have this idea that, well, can you help me with this? And can you help me with that? And so it's not just anyone can sponsor an entertainer. It ha You have to be in that particular field, yes? Not, it doesn't have to be, you know, in that specific field. Um, so if- It definitely helps. It helps. If I'm recruiting talents then for an event I'm doing, it would that- would that be enough for me to recruit a talent from overseas to bring for yes, with those special can. skills? Yes? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Could a YouTube influencer in say the most remotest part of of um, you know um a small country be considered an entertainer? 
So those are different. So here we're going into the <laughs> old one of the world. <laughs> um, believe it or not, in the last, you know, I'm sure in the last seven to 10 years, immigration has recognized social media ah. stars, social media folks as a kind of field. So it's not going to be entertain. It's not going to be culturally unique, but it's just it's going to fall under an O one, which is extraordinary ability. Very interesting. And is 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 that the same goes for like artists? I mean, like um people who are um, you know, what is the word that um design things like graphic artists? That it's that completely different category that have the artistic ability, painters, people who paint, people right. who are curators, exactly. stuff like that. Yeah, it's in that same group, yes, the O-1 group. Okay, so you you mentioned about the P-1 visa, the P-2, and, and so on. But I also want to ask you about um, this new um, immigration policy that um, President Biden um, kind of decided to... I'm not sure is it implemented or he's is discussing because uh and um possible implementation is it in, you know thirty thousand over a, a a period a period of time can you tell do you have any insight on that yes um so you're referring to the the new parole program parole program yes yes it was announced on January fifth mm -hmm. and they started accepting applications the very next day oh wow. <laughs> Yes. So, so in fact, it's it's an executive decision then? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. So the parole program is going to benefit 30,000 immigrants per month. Mm -hmm. from month. Together now, per month, from Haiti, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. Com combined. Combined. So yes. it's like a, a sum from this country and that totals to the 30,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we don't know, there's no indication of how long the program is going to last for. Hmm. And we don't know. <laughs> so we don't know if it's going to last for six months, if for two years. Um, according to the government, they will reevaluate as the program is developing. So what's happening is, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So this program, it actually started last year with only Venezuelans, okay? Mm -hmm. It was only available to Venezuelans up until January last week when they opened it up to the other countries. And the purpose of the program is to stop people from coming to the U.S. unlawfully and have them come in through this program instead. So... If you're a citizen of one of these countries and you go to the border, you will be denied entry and you will be sent back to Mexico and you will be and you will have to apply for the program. So how do you do the does one apply to the program? Well, as in if you're an immigrant in one of these countries, first you have to be outside of the US. If you're within the US, you don't qualify. Okay. Okay. Um you have to have a U.S. supporter. The supporter does not have to be a family member. It could be a family member. It could be a friend. It could be a church. It could be a business. I noticed you use the word supporter versus a sponsor. Is that? Yes. Is, okay. So that's what they're calling it now? That's what they're calling it for this program. Okay. Because, because the, difference, the difference here is we're not talking about parole. Us. We're not talking about a visa. Excuse me. We're not talking about a visa. So you're not sponsoring someone for a visa. We're not talking about a visa and we're not talking about a green card. Parole is the ability to enter the United States lawfully and to remain here for a temporary period of time. And during that temporary period of time, what is it that you need to do in order to become permanent? Is there, is there a road leads to that? There is no straight road to the green card or the citizenship. So is and it immigration has made that very clear? There is there they do not guarantee 
that you will have the ability to apply for a green card based off of this program. But oh, however, a lot of people will still benefit. Right? There's, because... there's some loophole though, I'm thinking. There has to be some loophole in this. And do they see it? There's so many yes, loopholes with this. With this. So for example, um, let's say that you're in one of these countries and you've been waiting for a green card for a long time, right? You have a family member who filed for you for a green card has been taking forever and you are able to come into the U.S. Well, you come into the U.S. and you're able to finish the green card process within the U.S. Okay, so that's one. Right. Or you can come in and you can marry someone, right? You're eligible to get married. And from that marriage, you're able to get your green card. And I'm thinking this is going to be another 90 day. Um, v <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to be one of those. I'm thinking 90 day fiance thing. But what is it? The K1? It's it's going to be another K1 in a sense. In a right but, camouflage as a as a K one in a way because if 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 the government is saying okay do not come to the border but here's a path to come and people apply and they said well you can come temporarily but we don't know yet um, when the next government is going to get rid of this executive decision because you know there's an election that's coming up and. Uh, we don't know any other steps that you can take to change your category, which is clearly to everyone. Well, you're going to have kids and you're going to get uh, get married and that's it. Yes. Yes. Um, it is very interesting to note that this program is going to be so the when you come in, the status that you're going to have is going to be for a maximum of two years. Well, what's going to happen in two years? Federal elections. And so in two years, that's when you decide to renew. And so your renewal, because, because in, is there anything about renewal in all of that? No, there's no guarantee that this program will be renewed at this time. Let me have your, your I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot because I know you, you know, the legal profession, you have to be careful um, and you, you, you know, your best interest. Um, have to have the best interest of um, your clients. So I may not necessarily ask your opinion on that, unless you want no, to want to no, share. No, no, no. Go right ahead. Go right ahead. What is your hey, what is, what what is your opinion on this type of um? I don't know. Is it called a policy? Is it called uh, an executive? I mean, executive decisions are policies. So, what is it? Our it's program? Okay, program. I honestly, I think it's going to help a lot of people. It doesn't okay. say problem because for example for venezuela so many people were leaving and crossing the border a lot of people have left venezuela and come have entered illegally because the country is in such horrible state okay mm -hmm. so um having people you know giving people the opportunity to come to the u.s without having to have a visa and coming in with a humanitarian status without having to risk their lives crossing the border or getting on a boat, I think is going to help a lot. Have you done um, the math? Um, 30,000 per month for 24 months. Has anybody done the math on that? So, and yeah, I'm, I don't know where they got the 30,000 um, people from. I don't know where they got that number from, but that's what they've set it up. But you have to understand I can, you know, I'm, I'm, because I'm so involved in the Haitian community and I'm Haitian, I can tell you that I've had clients because of the fact that the U.S. Embassy has been closed or functioning at very little capacity for the last three mm -hmm. years. They should have been in the U.S. a long time ago legally. Um, and they haven't been able to come in because of the fact that they're not able to get an appointment at the U.S. Embassy to mm -hmm. get their paperwork processed. I have a U.S. citizen husband who is literally risking his life to go see his wife because of the area of the country that she lives in. They've done everything right, like correctly, legally. Mm -hmm. Because of this program, she'll be able to come in with a humanitarian status without having to wait for the embassy to give her that appointment. And she could be reunited with her husband and she'll be able to get her green card physically here. 
which is well, cool. and and that's actually you know that's um kudos to president biden for doing that because when you explain it this way it's not just random well even though they're just individuals showing up but the connection you do have family members who are connected here waiting for their loved one the way that you explain it and um again because of um civil unrest in in those countries like venezuela 80 uh, and so on um and peru there are things going on in peru at this point as well there's a lot of things that happen pardon me peru's not the, right for now peru's not one of the countries on the list it's just haiti cuba nicaragua and um venezuela so i don't know if they're going to expand it you know down the line and and they may have to because then you know those people are going to show up. and what i'm learning uh, um and it's it's all over you know the the news um we can fact check <laughs> later but that some people are routing themselves to some of these countries and trying to get documents in those countries in order to be so any which way there are going to be people that uh, so how do you do the that find ways to kind of get through the system. What is your screening process like to make sure that the document is authentic, whatever you're doing for this particular client that reaches out to you and making sure that, um, you know, you uphold your own values of your law firm to make sure that you're taking on clients that are doing the right thing. What do you do? So we, we're actually pretty strict about, um, moving forward with cases and making sure that everything is 100% legit. Like I have, the way that I explain it to my clients when they ask me questions like, well, I see that I need to, I need a COVID vaccine. Can I just give you a paper that says I have it? Do I really need the vaccine? Uh. <laughs> I'm just like, listen, you know, number one, you're not lying on any, any immigration form. Number two, I'm not going to help you lie on any immigration okay. form your responsibility to be candid with the U.S. government and the, you know this little license that I have that the court you know that I <laughs> that the state gave me to be a licensed attorney like is extremely precious I'm not helping anyone commit any kind of immigration fraud whether it be marriage fraud business fraud like you can imagine the number of people that tried to put fake band members on their petition oh. <laughs> if I see that you better believe I do not allow it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my reputation as an attorney is just too about, I'm, I'm just, I'm just not going there. So yeah. we're pretty sure about that. I don't play that. I do not play that. Fair enough. So let me ask you this. Um, have you come across, are you getting applications so far, people contacting you or do you have a network of people that are referring clients to you to, um, based on this new parole program we do have some people that have contacted us i um actually filed some applications today it always a process is it a very difficult process or is it similar to any other um you know immigration application process it's not a difficult process um you, everything is going to be done electronically so the u.s supporter has to create a portal online submit all your information just like anything else um it's just about making sure that you fill out the paperwork correctly that you submit what they're asking for that it's complete that you follow the directions and that you know some people for example um they may have like i don't know like different situations where they do need that extra guidance so you know mm -hmm. someone retired or someone who had an immigration history in the past or someone um you know who has a pending case or someone who is trying to analyze are they better off continuing with their tourist visa or are they better off taking part of this parole program mm -hmm. um, i have a lot of u.s supporters potential u.s supporters reaching out to me for them to really understand like should they really be sponsoring someone or not they're you know, they have family members abroad asking them, please, 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 but what what does this entail? So what I've done um, is kind of just put information out mm -hmm. on our social media pages 
So I put out a lot of information so people really understand the program. And I don't hold anything back. Um, but yes, if someone reaches out to us at our firm for a consultation because they want, you know, clarification on their specific issue, half the time I'm like, but I answer that in the video, right? <laughs> right. But they want that time with the yes. attorney, you know, then they would just pay the consultation fee to, the for us to have one. Yes. So the fact that um, it's a parole program, first of all, you know, I'm concerned with the name itself. The word, you know, it's it's very stereotypical parole programs that mean the recipient is a parolee and, you know, all that um, on their back, put so to speak. Are you concerned about the language? Because I think every policy the language matters and the people who are recipient of the pro of the benefits from the program it matters to them i mean you know i can't imagine someone trying to explain how they got to the u.s and said well i was a member uh, i was a recipient of the parole and somebody who does not understand are you saying you were in prison you know are you saying that you're a parolee from you know do you understand because you'd be surprised that not because we may know and the information is at your fingertips. There are people that they, it just went right over their heads. So what do you think about the language itself? You know, it's interesting because as an immigration attorney, I am so concentrated. It's like I have blinders on, right? <laughs> I'm just, I don't even, to be honest, I don't even think about parole on, under criminal law because I don't do, I don't touch criminal law. I'm not involved in that process at all. Mm -hmm. For me, because I know immigration, how it's set up, when you're when you're at the border, um, it's either you're admitted or you're paroled under humanitarian parole. So for me, it's just, they're just using what they have at their disposition. Okay. They're not um, as a they're sociologist, not I'm going to tell you that, you know, these are some of the questions um, people ask and say, "Why couldn't they come up with a different name?" It is so burdensome that just the, the the context of it. So it's just something to bear in mind. So you you know we don't want to think that people who are coming across or people who are trying to get into this pro program are, you know, they could be highly educated people as well who have to flee their country who are very sensitive to certain languages, regardless of how it's translated to them. And so, or even when they do get to the, we know that categorization and, you know, um, labels is such a big thing in this country, which doesn't mean it's a good thing. It's just, it's, it's just a big thing. And it becomes this nuance where people have to explain what, or the difference between an immigration parole and, and a, a, a convict parole, I mean, it becomes too complex there for someone. And I think it's unfair. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. So the, the other is, thing, go ahead, please. Um, you know, it's, all I can tell you is, even if someone is a professional or, or not, mm -hmm. the second they're, the second that they enter the U.S. and they they've entered the legally, they're not gonna care what's on that paper. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not gonna care. It's um, just where, where it takes the freedom. Trouble. Yeah, you know, they're not gonna mind. <laughs> but I understand. I understand what you're. I understand your point. Um, mm -hmm. And <laughs> just because I just learned, like for me, parole is the legal status that you have when you enter the U.S. through a humanitarian status. That is, like that's what I have in my head. Like, that's what I know because right. that's what I eat. <laughs> you didn't know. Um, but honestly, you know that that that's a valid point, and I never I never looked at it from that perspective. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the difference? Because I know for eighty. Um, they were granted temporary protected status, I believe. Yes, TPS. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between this parole thing, uh, parole program now and the temporary protected status? Because I, it's not just 80 that received this. I think there's other countries that were on that as well. Um, I don't know if it's continuing because they uh, there's the impression is that things are kind of stable in 80. That's the impression they want to give. 
especially when they, when they want to do, do away with the program. So is there a big difference? And why not just call it temporary, temporary protective status instead of the new name? So that's a really great question. Um, temporary protective status are for those who are already physically in the U.S. Ah. And, and they're granted that status because immigration has made the determination that they're not that it would be inhumane to force them to go back to their home country at this time because of the fact that the country is facing such great political unrest there's a civil war or for example Haiti got Haiti was um designated for TPS in 2010 after the earthquake right so they have to make the finding that there's something that's really, really bad in your home country that at this time, they don't think it'd be humane to force you to go back if you are out of status within the US. So that's temporary productive status. So, and you're, they give TPS for a maximum of 18 months. And after each time that they award TPS, then immigration makes a study to see what is the current state of your home country and whether they're going to renew the TPS or not. Mm -hmm. So in November of last year, not only did they renew it, but they actually reopened it and redesignated it. Because now they're saying that, things are that bad there? Is that what they're saying? Correct. So for, for TPS, for Haitians at least, um, if you've physically been in the U.S. as a Haitian national, since before that November date, then you're going to qualify to file for TPS sometime in February. They haven't made the final announcements yet of when they're going to start accepting the TPS application. Very, very interesting, um, Patricia. See, I, I have some information, but not all. And you're filling in all the gaps here. Um, what, okay, so it's interesting. TPS, you have to be in the U.S. Parolee, you have to be outside the US in order Correct. to do that. Is there, for the, for the parole program, knowing that these individuals are mainly fleeing their country, not just due to civil unrest, but economic um, reasons as well, mm -hmm. they, do they waive the fee or are there, there's fees involved? Not for you as an attorney, but for the, to, in order to process the paper with immigration. There's no filing fee for this program. Very good. Wow. That must be There's good news no for, for, for individuals knowing that they don't have to come up with that money. Yeah. Can someone self-deport and then file for parole? The answer is it depends. So yes, but it depends. It just depends on how long they've been out of the country for, the documentation that they have, but yes. So the if there's no, the yeah, if there's there's no paper trail of them in the US, then it's the, it's like all signals go because they're flying under the radar in a sense. Well, when you self-deport, that's, okay. What I, what I understand as self-deporting is you have an order of removal on your file. Okay. And immigration hasn't deported you yet. So when you self-deport, you execute that order. Of like when you leave the country, you execute that order of removal yourself instead of having ICE do it. What, so, what I'm thinking of, go ahead. So you're thinking about someone who's here. No one knows that they're here. Yes. That's not called self-deport. It's something else. No, it, it could be. It just okay. depends on the situation. I was just thinking about someone with an actual removal order. Okay, fair enough. So we are down to the last minute and I'm going to give you the last word. Um, it sounds you're doing such a very, very interesting job. I can imagine just coming across different people, different stories and all the different, um, just the the way that you have to approach it to make sure that the whatever benefits are you know, necessary for them. Um, but I'm sure at points you have to say no to clients. Um, how do you do that? How hard is that for you? Or easy? <laughs> when you say, um, oh, we've exhausted everything, nothing here can work for you. You know, unfortunately, um, it's never easy, but 
I've I've had my law firm now for 10 years. 2022 made it 10 years since I've had mm-hmm. my law firm. Um, you know, I respect each individual client and I if I take on a case it's because I really want to help the person and I'm always noir sous blanc, um, black on white with them, making sure that they know from the very beginning, right? So what are the possibilities, is it good, et cetera. So as I guide them through it, um, we cannot promise miracles and I cannot commit fraud to get them what they need, right? So I I always try to manage their expectations from the very beginning so that, you know, they're they can handle it when we get to the end and unfortunately weren't able to give them what they were looking for. Thank you. And I appreciate you, you know, just emphasizing how beneficial the program is. I know I'm looking at it in so many different um on a different lens. And it just the way that you respond remind me that you are in the legal field and you, you know, it is necessary to look through those lenses as well, more of the benefit. Uh, and so this is how different the disciplines are. Um, and, and and I'm glad you emphasize the benefits really, because when there's no hope and you're given this little, you know, light or torch to just, you know, carry you through, why not take it versus being kind of caught up with the nuances, right? Um, yeah. So thank you for, for reminding that. Is there anything else you want to share about your law firm? And if you wish for anyone to, you know, reach out to you, anything that you want to share, and then we can end. Sure. So when it comes to immigration, um, your immigration case is very personal, right? And very important. Um, so you want to make sure that when you're trying to do anything on your status, apply for that, apply for a visa, apply for a petition, apply for asylum, whatever it is that you're doing, that you do your research on the person that you're looking to for help. Mm-hmm. Um, attorneys in the United States have to be barred by a state. So you definitely want to ask the attorney, if it's not obvious, what state are they barred in um, so that you can look them up on the bar's website. So, for example, in Florida, there's a Florida bar. Like Each state has a different bar where you can go and actually make sure that the person that's helping you is an attorney and that they don't have any kind of um, reprimand on their file. So Mm -hmm. make sure to do that. Secondly, um, unfortunately, there's a lot of notario fraud. So people who say they're lawyers and they're not, and they're out to get you and to oh. steal your money. Mm-hmm. So I've had cases, for example, where this one gentleman um, in Texas, he went somewhere and he was told that the person was an attorney and the guy just kept filing things for him and filing things for him. And he would get all this paperwork from immigration and he got a work permit. And he's like, oh, this is great. Well, yeah, you got a work permit because you he filed an application for you that allows you to have a work permit. However, the application was fraudulent and eventually it was denied. Oh, so, you know, just be careful of who is actually touching your case because anything that you sign, you're swearing that you've read everything and it is correct when you're signing anything that they have, they'll always have on you. Um, So just be mindful of that. There's a lot of information out there. For example, for this parole program, no, there is no filing fee. No, you do not have to pay the U.S. sponsor or anything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, be careful of scams. Like people are just, it's just, it saddens me that people take advantage of immigrants so much because like we're just so desperate as immigrants, right? Yes. Sometimes mm-hmm. we're willing to do anything or pay anything to have the opportunity at a better life. Mm-hmm. Um, for this parole program, you do not have to pay the person that's sponsoring you. So I've heard of people saying, oh, I'll sponsor you for X amount of money. Like That's not okay. That's not what this program is for. Right. So. I you know, quickly, <laughs> quickly. I, I know we, we talk about individuals, but we didn't specify. What about children? Because children, you know, that is those under the age of 18 as it's um, legally defined in the U.S. Um, right. In all this, I'm sure they're looking at the loophole in for, ch- you know, child trafficking and all that type of thing. How is, is there a different type of application for children? 
So it's the same application. However, you have to travel to the United States with at least one parent oh. or your guardian because they want to make sure that kids are not exactly are not trafficked. Hmm. You have to have a parent or a guardian that travels with you. And there has to be some documentation showing that this person is a guardian, this person is a parent. Correct. Very interesting. Elise, um, Patricia Elise, um, I'm forgiving it. Um, thank you so much. This is very informative. Um, I learned so much and I'm sure the, you know, people that um, are going to tune in to, um, you know, watch this is going to appreciate the information you talk about the P1 visa, the P3, and you also shared on the parolee. Um, it's parole, not parolee, parole um, program that is now offered. Thank you for your insight and thank you for, you know, being part of this humanitarian um you know, service, because that's what you're providing. You're looking out for for um, people who are in need and providing a service to them. And so I have a name now that regardless if you're in, as you said, Texas, you can call Patricia in um, Florida, Miami, Florida, and send help because um, immigration is um, federal law. So it's the same anyway, right? So- Correct. Yes. Thank you again, and um, hopefully we can chat again if there's a new program that we need to hear about. <laughs> I would love it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Bye.